wasn't in this yesterday and like I had no idea you know yeah we can ask her about it more today she really just touched on it yesterday so I think everybody um, benefited from I looked at them and like they're set up like the ones for Dawn's but like it's a lot harder like, of course it is love Thanks. that <laughs> It's mental health. It's not going to be as clear cut. <laughs> always is. See, look, you benefited from that hour too, Nicole. Mm. Oh yeah, I showered. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a bunch of stuff set up for you guys too. So, not that what you, you want to see some of it, but what do you want us to have out right now? Like our course pack or a book? Yes, course pack for depression. We're going to talk about depression. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to say I have on my phone. Hey, can we use this as like our group support? That's my question. Where's she? Oh, there she is. Because like, <laughs> no. <this> is, no? <laughs> I got to do that. I'm glad you said that. I forgot about that. Oh. Everyone has it to where they can see each other. I don't want anyone to see me. <laughs> it's nice to see everybody. I'm eating a plate of eggs. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's where my laptop is, right? What'd you say? Did That's you upstairs. I see a ceiling fan. Oh, it's upstairs. Oh, yeah. Do you need Thank this one? Um, right. Just leave that down here. Okay, so what's due today, Nicole? So today, um, you should have your, if you're keeping up with everything, so we're doing um, depression, suicide, so you would want to have your advanced organizer done would be what is ideal. So you want to keep up on those advanced organizers for those days um, so we can kind of touch base on them and see what questions you have about them. Someone said something about ATI being due. Um, by tonight at midnight, just your initial response. Just that very first um, kind of response to that initial video, the challenge video, okay. is what we want done um, ahead of time before clinical. Okay. So that's on ATI? Yep, it's just like the ones that you did for Dawn. Oh, okay. Okay. So you just go in, you do your case study there. And then um, what I did is I kind of broke it up so that the first, uh, the initial um, challenge video where you have to record your response to it, that part I went done before clinical so that your instructors can look at it during clinical. And that way, as soon as you start your clinical time, then you can start doing your peer um, reviews and stuff. Okay, so I have it counted as part of your clinical time. So you won't be there as <clears throat> necessarily as, as late for the days where you do those ATI. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we have quite a few people on. Um, you are welcome if you're kind of moving around, getting drinks, whatever. If you want to mute, go ahead. And then, of course, as you um, want to ask a question, just unmute, no problem. And I will start. Supposed I'm supposed to auto record, but I'm going to go. Yep, it's auto recording already. So, so then I will post it when we're all done. Okay. Okay. All right. So, did I, did you guys do the advanced organizer or no? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, I did. Okay. So we're getting some yeses. So let's go through. Um, I'm gonna run through the answers real quick on the first page of it. Okay. So we're in your course pack. We're looking at the advanced organizer, and then we're gonna move on to the depression course pack. If it boots us off after 40 minutes, I'm gonna resend out a, a quick. Um, a quick another one so we can join in really fast and do maybe 30 minutes to try to finish up as much as possible and then I'll record whatever we don't get to. Okay, so I have um, number one as C, 2, G, 3, I, 4, H, 
5D, 6E, 7B, 8A, 9F. Did we do okay with that? You can just nod if you're muted. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So I do want to make sure one thing that sometimes gets confusing is that definition of suicidal ideation. I don't know what I'm looking at right now. <laughs> Um, is that definition of suicidal ideations and it is um, you really want to understand that ideations are very different than um, intention so ideations are just thoughts so thoughts of you know of hurting self it does not necessarily mean that the person wants to hurt themselves so I usually try to provide some you know some personal type of examples I can tell you that personally I have had suicidal ideations. I have not, however, had any intentions. I've never needed to be like hospitalized or anything for them because I don't have any want, I don't have any intentions, I have things that are preventing me, but those ideations can be very scary and, and, and real and require some um, help. So when you do get a chance to go into the psychiatric unit, that is often a reason why a lot some patients are there is because they don't feel safe simply because they're having those thoughts, not that they wanna act on them. Okay, if we go to the next page of that advanced organizer, um, were there any specific questions about the different types of depression? Did they make, did they pretty much make sense? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. And then give me a couple, what are a couple ways that, a um, couple behavioral clues that indicate somebody at high, is high risk for suicide? What are some red flag types of things? Giving away prized possessions. Giving away prized possessions, absolutely. What else? Writing farewell notes, making a will. Farewell notes, writing farewell will, notes. Getting things in order, for sure. Global insomnia. Global insomnia. And do we know what that means? Anybody know what that means? No. I've seen some no's. So well, there's different types of insomnia. I think you talk about them um, later in the program, but there's uh, insomnia where it's difficult to fall asleep. There's insomnia where it's difficult to stay asleep. And there's insomnia where it's, it's early wakening. And so global insomnia really kind of encompasses all that, where there's just difficulty in sleep kind of overall. So it's just kind of a, um, uh, just when you think of the term insomnia, that's what global insomnia is, is just difficulty sleeping in general. Um, another one is neglecting hygiene. Okay, so neglecting hygiene. And then another one, this is another one that I, uh, we really need to make sure that we understand. And because it's not one that we think about initially, but it is an unexpected improvement. So it's when the patient goes from being really depressed uh, and then they kind of flip a switch and they suddenly seem like they are uh, not always happy. It can be happy. It's not always happy, but it could be that they're content or they're at peace. And so what we want to think about with that is that that person has made the decision to end their life. And so the suffering that they currently have, they see an end to it. And so that's where that kind of change in behavior can happen. Now we watch for this very specifically in the early um, parts of antidepressant therapy, which is why it's which is why it's really helpful to um, to have patients hospitalized during that time frame. So. What can happen early on in antidepressant therapy is that the patient is still having some suicidal thoughts, but sometimes they get kind of a little bit more energy. They get to where their, their thinking is, is a little bit clearer. They can start to plan stuff. Uh, so you have somebody who's still having suicidal thoughts, but now maybe has the energy that they lacked before and the concentration that they lacked before to actually develop and follow through with a plan. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not always our most severely depressed patients who can't get out of bed that we worry about suicide with. It's often those patients that are kind of in the early stages of treatment 
and um, are, are starting to feel a little bit better. So that's a really important concept to understand. Okay, what do we come up with for number 12? Assess bowel sounds. Yep, assess bowel sounds, good. 13? B, C, and D. B, C, and D, yes. We don't wanna give her privacy at this point. Um, we still speak to patients, we use, um, you know, and, and we spend time with patients even though they're not necessarily responding to us. Definitely want to assess and definitely want to encourage that food and fluids. And then what did we get with number um, 14? See. Somebody else, what did we get? D. Did you say D? Mm -hmm. D. D is in dog, yes. So we want to give specific information. We want to make sure, sorry, my allergies are acting up. I promise it's just allergies. Um, that when your mom's pre-survived, we found her uh, cutting her wrist with the glass from a framed photo. So we want to give information that is accurate and gets to the severity of what's going on. Any questions with the case study? Did that um, make sense? As far as signs and symptoms, at least? Yeah. 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 And then what we get for some of the types of therapeutic communication? You can go ahead and unmute if you want to answer. And if you have a lot of background noise, go ahead and mute, too, so we're not hearing it, okay? But um, unmute to answer, please. Restating. There's some restatement in there. Sure. What else? Open-ended questions. Open-ended questions. Good. My favorite one. Does anybody remember what my favorite one is? It's in there too. There's some reflection. There's some um, clarification. And so when our patients do something we call it overgeneralization when they overgeneralize something like everything is just horrible right now so they may feel that way but i can't do anything about that um i can't help them with everything being horrible if i can i can try to clarify and say can you give me one thing that's happened in the past 24 hours that you think is horrible and then we can discuss that one Thing and maybe come up with a way to cope with that or a resolution to it or a way to problem solve it. So um, we, that clarification is really helpful when we're trying to get patients to, um, you know, kind of kind of work through what their issues are, which is a lot of what mental health nursing is, is trying to facilitate those patients in their own problem solving and coping. Um, there's some directing in there, trying to get patients to have, um, you know, more accurate information and helping the patient to see more positive um, attributes. Okay, so we're going to go on um, to the actual handout at this point and uh, just going to kind of start the lecture, see how far we can get, and I'll kind of skip over the case studies and do those as a separate um, some of it we'll do as, as a separate piece. So depressive disorders do not discriminate. They're common across uh, races, genders. Um, they cause a lot of pain and suffering. So there's a lot of people out there that suffer from different depressive disorders. There's also a lot of comorbidities. Anxiety and depression go hand in hand. Uh, a lot of people use substances, have personality disorders, or even eating disorders. And as we discussed in fundamentals, um, older adults, one, they tend to have more chronic illnesses, which tends to go along with depression, but two, they can be misdiagnosed because some of the signs and symptoms of depression can mimic things like delirium or even early dementia because there's issues with problem solving, there's issues with concentration and memory. And so it is important that we're looking at 
you know, depression, is it sudden onset, is there another cause, things like that. And children um, tend to be a little bit more somatic. So if you remember the term somatic, that means pertaining to the body. And so when kids are depressed, they may manifest that in a more somatic fashion, such as a headache or a stomach ache, versus, you know, solely saying that they're sad and they can't feel better. So etiology, of course, it's a combination of things, genetics, traumatic life events, neurotransmitter deficiencies. Um, so genetics, they have looked at adaptive studies and uh, genetics does play a factor that there, there does tend to be more in people who are related, but also environment has to play a role in that too. So events or environment really are what trigger that genetic predisposition to depression. The biochemical factors, uh, a lot of neurotransmitter issues, uh, most, mostly low. So serotonin, I'm not going to ask you specifically what does serotonin um, do. I have it listed on there, but I'm not going to ask you, you know, which one is serotonin responsible for, which one is norepinephrine responsible for, but you should know that they both play a role in depressive symptoms. Cash, no. Sorry, my dog's going to eat a bone right beside my feet. Um, so... We want to think about those different uh, symptoms as well as both of those being low causes pain issues. So physical pain is a symptom of depression. It does go along with depression in a lot of patients. Maybe you've heard some of the like Cymbalta or the SNRIs, um, Cymbalta Effexor, if you've heard some of those commercials. Uh, Cymbalta specifically talks about uh, depression hurts and that's because that's the pain side to it. Now, um, stressful events, especially losses, are significant in the development of depression. So we do see those life events triggering lower levels of neurotransmitters. And we can see neuroendocrine factors. We can see changes on imaging. I don't usually get into the specifics of that, but just know that, they, that sometimes there are actual structural abnormalities that happen with depression. So let's talk about the psychosocial theories. So there's usually stress combined with a biological um, vulnerability or predisposition. So we have that genetic predisposition and then there's a stressor that comes into play. So early trauma can actually cause a long-term hyperactivity. So when a child uh, has a traumatic event, it changes the way that the neurotransmitters respond. And so they can become um, they can become kind of hypersensitive to those traumatic events. And so what can happen later on is that um, they become sensitized even to minor uh, stressors that happen in adulthood and then trigger those major depression episodes. So, so the traumatic events early on changes the way that the brain chemistry works in those who are predisposed. Also know that even in those who aren't, don't have the early trauma, significant stressors later in life can also change the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain. So they can um, develop depression even without the early traumatic events. So the cognitive theory and hopefully this makes uh, a lot of sense to you um, that when children have these early life experiences and they are negative experiences, what happens is it really changes their thought process about the world. And this thought process becomes kind of ingrained into these these kids and later teens and adults. And so it predisposes them to depression. So these early life experiences contribute to negative, illogical, irrational thought processes that may remain dormant until they're activated during times of stress. So they're not always rational, um, or they're not really ever rational thoughts. So what can happen is the person can kind of overcome these on a regular basis, but when they're under an extreme amount of stress, then they can, they can resurface. So we'll talk about what that means here in a minute. 
but this is called Beck's cognitive triad. And so they have this negative self-deprecating view of self, meaning their thoughts are like, I'm not a good person. Okay, so that's what they think. I'm not a good person. They have a pessimistic view of the world. The world is not a good place. And they have the belief that negative reinforcement or no validation will continue. No matter what I do, nothing ever changes. No matter what I do, nothing ever changes. And can you see how a child who's maybe abused would develop this? They don't think they're a good person. They don't think the world's a good place. And they don't think that there's anything that they can do to fix it. And so those thought processes, um, as you turn the page, those thought processes um, start to cause these automatic negative thoughts. So those are repetitive, repetitive, unintended, and not easily controlled. So you have this child who is abused and then um, they get into a relationship as they're older and then that person maybe starts yelling at them because they're angry or upset. Do you see how they could start to go back to that? I'm not a good person. No matter what I do, nothing ever changes. It's not a good place. And they start to have these automatic negative thoughts that are difficult to control. And so what happens is what's helpful for these patients are, is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. And so that cognitive behavioral therapy helps them identify and test that negative cognition. So remember, we don't do therapy, but we use those principles in order to help our patients. So can we help them identify and test their negative cognition? Absolutely. So can we, you know, say, you know, what, um, you, you're saying you're not a good person. Can you give me an, an example of how you're, how you're not a good person? Let's examine that. Let's see if there's ways in which you, you are a good person too. So let's try to balance, you know, look at this in a balanced way. Develop alternative thinking patterns. So instead of saying, you know, you got into a fight with your significant other because you're not a good person or the world's not a good place, was it maybe that you guys have discussed something and you're forgetting to do what was discussed. Could it be that your significant other had just a really bad day and took it out on you, which wasn't appropriate? You know, and so you try to think about those alternative patterns, that this is something um, that is an isolated event and it's something that can be worked on. And so you try to, try to help them see that. So they rehearse new cognitive and behavioral responses. And so we'll um, talk a little bit about that, but what we can do is try to help them stop those negative thoughts. And there's ways to do that. Anything from like a rubber, like a, like a rubber band or hair tie on the wrist um, to visualizing like a stop sign in their head when they start to go really negative and learning how to, to change it around, not necessarily to a positive, but to an accurate statement. We got into an argument. This is something we can work through. We just need to cool off. I can, you know, we can work through this specific issue. Okay. Um, another theory is learned helplessness. And so it, you probably have learned about learned helplessness a little bit in a, a psychology course. They did some really awful studies on this. Um, what they did is they actually, they tied a dog or tied dogs up to like a platform in which they got electric shocks. And so those dogs could not get away from the electric shocks. And so they learned that they were helpless in the given situation. So they took those same dogs, put them on electric shocks, but didn't tie them up. Those dogs did not try to get away from the electric shocks because they had learned that they were helpless in that situation. So even though they could get away, they didn't. So that's kind of some studies that they, they did initially on what learned helplessness is. But when we look at it from a depression standpoint, it's the anxiety and the initial response to a stressful situation, but it is replaced by depression um, if the person feels no control over the outcome of the situation. So specifically what, what we look at is that they have the belief 
that the undesired event is their fault. So they have the belief that the undesired event is their fault, but they can't change it. But they can't change it. And so that makes somebody very prone to depression. The clinical picture is really in the advanced organizer. Um, to go through nursing process here, uh, a lot of these are, you know, definitions and things here. So I'm going to run through them a little bit. I, everything's going a little bit quickly this morning, but um, you'll be able to, to replay it. So there are some assessment. There's certain tools. We don't use a lot of these tools on the actual psychiatric floor because we already know what the patient has. So in fact, a lot of these tools are used more on a med surge floor or long-term care. So like, um, like certain scales to see if somebody has depression or to see if a geriatric patient has depression. There's a few of those in your textbooks. More of what uh, we tend to use is more of just sort of a rating scale like you're going to be using on your mental status exams for your clinical patients. So just a zero to 10 rating scale. Can you rate your anxiety this morning? Can you rate your depression, um, your depressive thoughts? That type of thing just so we can kind of keep track of them. The suicide potential, we'll get into that a little bit more, but uh, the questions really that, um, that you're going to be asking come from that Columbia uh, suicide assessment scale, so you want to make sure that you have that. Uh, you're going to be utilizing that next week, I believe. Um, so you're going to utilize the long one, the, I think it's kind of like a, I think they call it salmon, it's like an orangey type color. So when we're looking at that suicide potential we not only want to know what they have um, thought about but we have to get to the details of what their plan is how likely are they to actually carry it out and what's preventing them and that's sometimes something we forget but wanting to know what are their resources that they have and we want to pull those into their plan of care so if um, i've had somebody tell me that the only reason that they haven't killed themselves is because of their children. I had several, lots of people tell me that actually. So do we put a picture of their kid in their, in their room? Do we talk about what that, you know, what that resource is and make that a plan of their care? Do we try to ensure that they get to talk to their child, you know, each day? And so whatever those resources are, sometimes it's religion. Um, we want to make sure that that becomes part of their plan of care. So mood, obviously you're gonna see depression, anhedonia. What's anhedonia, anybody? Is it lack of enjoyment? Yeah. Lack of enjoyment or pleasure from pleasure. life, yes. So the way that you're gonna see that though is the patient, I mean obviously the patient doesn't say I have no pleasure in life anymore, they're going to more likely tell you about something that they enjoyed doing that they just don't like anymore. I've had people tell me, older adults tell me, you know, I loved it when my grandkids would come over to visit. And now I'm to the point where I just, I just, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Or your, you know, their child gives them a hug. And instead of getting that, that pleasure from that hug that they used to get, it's just neutral. It's nothing. Um, hobbies, anything along those lines. Inertia is just that, that lack of energy, a lot of feelings of worthlessness or guilt, and then there's helplessness that leads into hopelessness. So when somebody feels helpless for a while, then they start to feel hopeless about the future. Um, anger, so there can be a lot of anger and depression, irritability, and that anger, irritability can be directed towards self, or it can be directed towards others. Um, physical changes. You'll see a change in people's posture. So they'll, they'll tend to be more hunched over, less eye contact. So kind of look down towards the ground more. Uh, their facial, they can look older. I mean, they can, they can kind of like somebody, well, not as significant as somebody with drug use, but um, kind of along those lines where they just look older than what they really are. Facial expressions, so they tend to have that flat facial expression. And so what flat is, 
is instead of having that wide range of emotion that you tend to see on people's faces, like um, you tend to see on mine, I tend to have a lot of expressions on my face. So instead of having, you know, the range of motion that is kind of, let's say if it's usually here, then you're gonna get a range of emotion that's like here. So you might get the kind of smile when you first sit down. And then after that, it just goes kind of, kind of blank, kind of flat. If they're talking about something that really, really makes them happy, you might get a, a little bit of a smile um, or something that makes them extremely sad. You might get a, a slightly sad look, but it's just, it's not nearly what you would expect for what they're discussing. It also has psychomotor retardation that can actually be slower in their movements um, or they can have psychomotor agitation where they're just kind of moving around a lot. It can kind of look like, you know, like restlessness, um, anxiety, neglect, hygiene, and then a lot of, uh, a lot of sighing. So we can see that with depression as well. Um, I, Another sign that you can see, and this kind of goes along more with the atypical um, depression, is hypersomnia. So with atypical depression, you, and that tends to happen more in younger population, you see oversleeping, you see overeating, hypersomnia, hyperphagia, where when we talk about more classic depression, you tend to see more of the vegetative signs where they're not sleeping, they're not eating, they're um, constipation, you know, not able to go to the bathroom, no libido, uh, lots of pain, so things like that. When we look at cognition, so cognition is, is slower, uh, less concentration in memory, they tend to exaggerate their faults. So they spill something and they're like, oh, I'm so, you know, I'm so clumsy all the time. I can't do anything right. Instead of saying, oops, I, you know, I, I dropped that. I need to clean it up. So it's more exaggerated in nature. Those suicidal ideations, um, they have problems, problem solving, issues with problem solving and very, you know, indecisive. So these are patients that can sometimes be frustrating because they can't make a decision and you have to, so you really have to kind of sometimes narrow down what they have as far as decisions go uh, or really help them through that problem solving, like making pros and cons lists, things like that to help them. Additional assessments. So when somebody comes in for depression, we always want to know, is there certain, you know, is there a loss? Is there something major that's gone on lately? We want to know about what treatments have and haven't worked. And I'm so surprised by the number of people that don't ask that question because often our patients do know what hasn't worked for them especially or what has worked in the past really well. And that can really be, um, can save some significant trials of medications. What kind of support do they have? What kind of over-the-counter remedies might they be taking? Are they using drugs? Have they had any history of psychosis? Um, definitely their medical conditions because patients with depression often neglect their medical conditions and how are they adhering to their medications. So self-assessment. So not only do we need to assess our patients, but with any type of mental health patient, we should be assessing ourselves as well. And this can it can be frustrating because we may not really see, we may be doing a lot to try to help the patient, but we may not be seeing a change in our patient very quickly. It isn't, it, it isn't like giving an antibiotic or changing a, a dressing wound or giving pain medication where we see that relief right away. It can take a long time, um, days, weeks, for patients to come out of a major depression episode. So we're not going to see that immediate response, and we have to be ready for that so that we're not frustrated. Uh, one thing I just want to share with you is that I've had students, and, and they use, uh, have used silence with patients who are very severely depressed. So you have somebody, and they, are, they don't want to respond. And so the student goes in, and well, they ask me, they're like, what do I do? And, and I'm like, just go into their room, if, if you're allowed in their room, or wherever they are. And